I do believe, friends, that freedom is, is something that people of God should always continue to live in and learn more about. Say amen, somebody. It is a topic that we can never get too far away from. What we mean about freedom is there's always some level of freedom that we need to experience in our lives. And, and today I want us to continue to grow and, and go and, and glow up in in what it means to be set free. You know, there are a lot of loud voices that we hear in our lives every day. Some of them are external, and some of those loud voices are internal. Say amen, somebody. And, and those voices, wherever they come from, they cause us to, to, to be far removed from the voice, the one true voice, that should have the loudest impression, and that is God, the creator of our lives. That voice, that one voice, is the voice we should be leaning in to the voice we should be um, respecting the most. But, but oftentimes, we, we pull back from that voice because of the other voices. Kelly, turn me down just a little bit, just for a second. So today, I, I want to talk about a couple of things that, that I've spoken about before, but I, I'm choosing to talk about it again today because we always have new people within our community say amen, somebody. Y'all ain't run everybody off. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> Uh, and so because there's always new people and new faces and new ears, some have not heard this good news that God does call us to, to live into and to experience in our lives. And one of those areas of, of, of freedom that I do believe that God calls us to, to live free from, uh, which has existed from generations to generations, is being bound in... Uh, this thing called shame and this thing called guilt. Shame and guilt. Does anybody know those two words? Shame and or guilt. Shame and guilt, it infiltrates, it perpetrates upon the essence of who we are when we allow it to. Shame and guilt has existed, as I said, from Many, many generations, everybody in this room, whether you want to admit it or not, has had one moment or another where you have carried guilt or shame around with you for far too long. Say amen, somebody. Perhaps it was when you took the early morning walk this morning. You took a walk of shame. Ain't nobody looking at you, but yeah, you took it, you took it. You snuck in the church? Church started 1035, you came in at 1105. But God is still good, say amen. Somebody, ain't nobody asking where you have been. Maybe you know what shame is when someone uh, unleashed the word shame on you for something that you did. Or, or maybe you've had to say that phrase to yourself or to someone else. Or maybe you're familiar with the phrase, uh, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. Yeah, shame, 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 and it's cousin guilt. Brothers and sisters, they are powerful emotional forces. And the simplest way to differentiate between the two is simply to remember this. Guilt, brothers and sisters, it is an action, whereas shame is about your character. Mm, I'll put it this way. Keep it clear. Shame, shame is feeling bad about yourself as a person. I'm worthless. I'm unlovable. I'm broken. I am bad. Guilt does this. Guilt is feeling bad about what you did. That ain't her wallet in her hand. Say amen, somebody. <laughs> I did something bad. Shame is a focus on self. Guilt is a focus on behavior. Shame is, again, I am bad. Guilt is I did something bad. Guilt is I'm sorry. I made a mistake. Where a shame is I am a mistake. Why is pastor preaching about this today? Because I believe that somebody in this room needs to be set free from understanding the grips of both shame and guilt upon your life. 
shame, and guilt. They're closely tied together. Oftentimes, they're used interchangeably. Uh, when the emotions or the feelings of disgust come up, shame or guilt are tied to that. When the emotion or the feeling of embarrassment comes into play, shame and guilt are generally associated with that. Humiliation, when you feel that, either shame or guilt or both are associated. Regret, remorse, self-consciousness, those are things that are also associated with shame and guilt. But the Bible has a lot to say about both of these topics, shame and guilt. And some of the biblical failures that we know today, only we remember them for their successes. We don't think about them because of their failures, but before they were successes, they were indeed failures. You don't believe me? Let me take you to a couple of them. Adam and Eve, they're the first two failures that we see in the scriptures that we know as the Bible. Adam and Eve, they are people who understood both shame and guilt. Their story offers us some principles that will help us to, to understand what it means to be set free from uh, being inundated with shame and guilt and freely being able to embrace the grace and mercy of God that's essential in living free from these things and living in victory in this life. Can you do me a favor, since we're here in church, uh, you chose to come here, nobody put a gun to your head, a water gun, a real gun, any kind of gun to your head. Nobody said you better come to Live Community Church. So since you chose to come here, would you please do me a favor and, and talk to your neighbor and tell them, say, it's time to shatter shame. Wait, don't stop talking, don't stop talking. Now say, and give up guilt. Tell them to the second option. This person, you ain't want to talk to them. Turn, turn to them, the other elbow neighbor. Tell them the same thing. Say, it's time to shatter the shame. And it's time to give up the guilt. And, and if the neighbor you really don't want to talk to ain't sitting next to you, you got their phone number, text them. Tell them. Say, it's time. I'll wait. Tell them. Time to shatter the shame and give up the guilt. Yeah. Shame is rooted in insecurities. Guilt, brothers and sisters, though, it is often an important guidepost to let us know that we have acted outside of our value systems. And it can lead to positive behavioral changes if we allow it to. However, shame uh, can become uh, very toxic. And it's a problem that tends to keep us stuck in secrecy and self-doubt. Shame cannot be a precursor to self-improvement. And if somebody tells you that it can, they are lying. Shame is not a precursor to self-improvement, although, as I just said, guilt can become a guidepost to help you be better. Maybe you're here today and you're dealing with one or the other, or maybe you're dealing with both of these two things. And maybe you're struggling with something and you're here today, or maybe you haven't been in church for a long time, or, or you haven't dealt with this issue between you and a relationship with the Creator, God, because you still struggle with something called shame and or guilt. And maybe it's because of something you said or something you did a long time ago, and you're still dealing with it or the shame of it. Maybe, maybe you made a mistake a long time ago and you're still dealing with the guilt of it. Maybe you dropped the ball some time ago and you're still embarrassed about it and you're still dealing with the guilt and the shame of it. So, so, so you have a hard time being present in a place like church. Maybe someone repetitively called you a name that's not your birth given name. So that seed was planted in you deep down inside of you and it is how you see yourself and subsequently that self is seen in a negative way. You know, so many of God's children become immobilized by our past, by what happened to us. Yeah. 
by what happened to us. And for those of us that are not immobilized by our past, we're acting out in bad behavior by something that has happened to us. So when your pastor says, uh, what happened to you? It, it, it's not because she's trying to be funny or be cute or be clever. It's because I know that just asking what's wrong with you is surface level. That's just the surface. You can tell me ain't nothing wrong with you, but what I see is something far different than what I know. So what I know is what I see is one thing, but what I know is something different. What you're showing me is something far different than what I see. So I don't want to ask you, oh, what's wrong with you? Because you can say nothing. But what I see is some crazy acting behavior. So what happened to you that causes you to behave in a way that is inconsistent with who I believe that you are? Something has happened to all of us at some level. While I would love to believe that we are all perfectly perfect, the truth of the matter is, you look good now, but all of us got some little bit of crack. Not crack, like the drug, but crack. I ain't got that, there ain't nothing no cracks. I'm talking like broken, I'm talking chipped. The devil is a liar, but got something in us that has happened to us. Right, Dr. Lisa? All right. But what ends up happening is that whatever happened to us, it prevents us from moving forward into a faith-filled future with God. Shame and guilt keeps us shell-shocked and stuck in the rut of feeling hopeless and helpless. And oftentimes, even if you get free from feeling hopeless and helpless, Something else will trigger you, and you back on the merry-go-round of feeling hopeless and helpless. You get off the merry-go-round, woo, you get triggered again, and your butt back on the merry-go-round of feeling hopeless and helpless. Well, let's unpack this a little bit. Shame and guilt. It causes us to cover up our mess with inadequate means. Do we really want to be removed from these two things? Well, let's talk about what shame and guilt does. Shame and guilt causes us to cover up the mess that we are in with inadequate means. Genesis chapter 3 verse 7 says this. We're still talking about Adam and Eve. At once they saw what they had done. And they realized that they were, say it with me, naked. Then they sewed fig leaves together to do what? <laughs> to cover themselves. Brothers and sisters, it's really hard to keep trying to hide dirt. The only thing to do with dirt is to get rid of it. Get it out of your house, vacuum it out of your car, get it away from you. God created these two people to rule and reign on the earth. But they disobeyed God and their eyes subsequently were open and, and they knew that they were naked and afraid. It's not just a TV show. It really did happen. They became self-conscious of their own weakness and their own vulnerability. And they became aware that they were absolutely exposed. And the next thing we see them doing is critical. Look at Adam and look at Eve as they try to cover their mess with inadequate means. They try to cover up their mess with some, some cheap sheen fabric, some, some, some cheap Timu outfits, some Fashion Nova fig leaf underwear. Let me break it down what these emotions can do for us and to us. When not reconciled, when shame and guilt really isn't dealt with appropriately, you will see these emotions manifest like this. 
you don't love yourself, but you try to cover up your own self-hatred by abusing and misusing other folks. Tell somebody that ain't nothing but a cheap fig leaf. You go around talking about other folks when the truth is you jealous of the very folk you talking about. Tell somebody that ain't nothing but a cheap fig leaf. You, you walk around demanding perfection from everybody else when the truth is you haven't really dealt with the imperfections in your own life. Tell somebody, oh, that ain't nothing but a cheap old fig leaf. Oh, you work and you work and you work and you work, then you work and you work and you work some more. When the truth is, you stay at work because you don't want to have to deal with what's facing you when you get home. Tell somebody that ain't nothing but a cheap old fig leaf. And the problem with fig leaves, brothers and sisters, is this. They always end up falling apart. Might last through the first wash or the second wash. But I assure you, by the third wash, you're looking for a needle and some thread. <laughs> Sooner or later, the very thing, the very thing, the very thing that you think is you, you decided to try to use to cover up your mess be the very thing that will end up revealing what your mess really is. Brothers and sisters, fig leaves were never, never designed to cover up our nakedness. what the mercy and grace of God is for. Yeah. Okay, let's unpack further. Shame and guilt causes us to seek refuge in ratchet and reckless and ridiculous places. Put ratchet, but I'm gonna have to break that down for somebody. Because we have a very diverse community. Some of us are very highbrow. Some of us are very, very lowbrow. Some of us are just very brow in between. Uh, but but ratchet, it, it's not good. <laughs> Uh, so shame can cause us to seek refuge, to seek refuge, to seek a, a hiding place, if you will, in ratchet and reckless and ridiculous places. Let's check out Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Adam and Eve, we're still talking about them. They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man, Adam, and his wife, Eve, they hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Shame and guilt causes us to seek refuge in ratchet, reckless, and ridiculous places. Trees, really? <laughs> they decided to hide among some trees? Now, if I'm trying to hide from God, I think I'd probably go into a cave at least. But trees? Friends, if you've got a need, should you go to the place where you can get your need met? Stick with me. If you're sick, where do you go? If, if, if your car breaks down, where should you go? Somebody said to my uncle. Okay, same thing. To your, uh, <laughs> if your uncle is your version of the mechanic, cool. If you want to go buy some food, where do we go? To a grocery store, to a market. If your tooth hurts, where should you go? To a dentist's office. My brothers and sisters, that principle is true in the natural, and that principle is also true in the emotional and the mental, and certainly in the spiritual realms as well. Let me let you in on a little secret. Lean in, y'all. You ain't got no hiding place that God don't know about. Listen up closely. There isn't a trap house, a crack house, a whole house, a booster bus, a daddy land party, a casino queen. (laughs) 
Baby, you don't know nothing about no daddy land. I'll explain it later. He, he don't. He don't know nothing about that. Where you can hide from God. My brothers and my sisters, it is ridiculous to think you can hide from God. If you try to play hide and go seek with God, let me tell you, God always wins. David said it best. He declares in, in Psalms 139, 7 through 10, he says, your spirit is everywhere that I go. He's talking to God. I cannot separate. I cannot escape your presence. If I go up to heaven, you'll be there. If I go down to the place of death, you will be there. If I go to the east where the sun rises or if I go to the west beyond the sea, even there you will take my hand and you will lead me. Your strong right hand will protect me. God is everywhere that we go. So shame and guilt can try to cause you to seek refuge in ridiculous, ratchet, and reckless places. But the truth is, once you get it worked out, you understand where you really should be seeking refuge to. I'm going to unpack it a little bit further. Shame causes us to run from the one we should run to. Okay? We're still talking about Adam and Eve. Amen? Genesis chapter 3, verse 8. Late in the afternoon, when the breeze began to blow, <laughs> y'all know we need that, right? <laughs> Lord, let it blow. The man and the woman heard the Lord God walking in the garden, so they hid behind some trees. Verse 10 he said, this is the man talking to God. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid myself. Now, before they bit into the fruit, they used to run to God when God would come to, the, to them in the garden. But now, all they could think to do was run and hide. The very presence they longed for was the very presence they are now running from. And that's what shame and guilt does to us. It makes us run from the one we should be running to. And that's why when you're dealing with a shameful or a guilt-filled situation, the spiritual enemy, aka the devil, the evil one, attempts to make you want to stop coming to church. Attempts to make you stop wanting to go to Bible study. All of a sudden, your attendance in your life group has dropped off. Or anything that is connected with the body of Christ, you start to distance yourself from. And I wonder how many of us, even right now, are following Christ from a distance today. No, I get it. We're, we're here at church but we're standing at a guilty distance in our hearts. Do, do you know your body can be in church, but your heart can be far from God? I, 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 I mean, just because people in church doesn't mean anything really to me. You could sleep in your garage all night long. That don't make you a car. You went to sleep in the garage, you woke up in the garage. Oh, baby, you're still not a car. <laughs> Your lips can be saying and singing the right things, the right words, but your heart can be far from God. And the enemy will try to take something that you did, watch this, and try to convince you that what you did, that's actually who you are. And so even though you're sitting here, amongst others who are convinced that they are no longer what they did, something inside of you is still repeating the message, oh, yes, you are. You are absolutely what you did. That's called the accuser, the spiritual enemy, the one who wants to keep you feeling like a failure. 
accusing you continuously of what you've done. That negative type of thinking, it is personal. It keeps you focused on yourself and the thing that you did. It keeps uh, you in this permanent state as if there is no more future for you. It is pervasive, which means it spreads over every area of your life. You made a mistake in this one thing and all of a sudden you are a failure in every single area of your life. Well, I believe today God wants to teach us how to triumph over the accuser. Say amen, somebody. The accuser is always trying to make us ashamed, but thanks be to God that the Holy Spirit is the one who Christ has given to us and that one is the advocate. That one is the opposite of the accuser, the advocate, the Holy Spirit, is the one who wants to walk alongside of us, the one who wants to come to us to, to give us comfort and to give us wisdom, and the one who wants to bring us to a place of hmm, holy conviction. Some of y'all like, wait, there's a difference between feeling accused and feeling conviction, feeling holy conviction? Yes. Holy conviction is when God doesn't just show you what needs to change. God also gives you the grace and the power to begin to change. Yeah. I'm going to say that one more time. You recognize, ah, there is something that needs to change inside of me, and I don't quite have the strength to do it on my own. So the Lord leads you to a strong AA group that helps you to have support or an NA group that helps you to have the resources to keep on keeping on so your addiction doesn't have to take you out, that you can still stand strong. Yeah, God gives you what you need in order that you can survive. This is one example. Y'all still with me? Amen. So when we are dealing with shame and guilt, one of the best ways in order for us to do that is to boost stuff our emotional intelligence. Say emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence is not your intellectual intelligence. According to really smart people, you can't change that. You get what you get when you're born. You can't change that. But perhaps emotional intelligence can be altered. And, and so emotional intelligence, it, it helps to free us from the snares of guilt and shame. For example, uh, when you are freed from it, you stop feeling guilty about the things you shouldn't feel guilty about. Don't feel guilty about moving on. That relationship is over. It wasn't good for you. You got out of it. Now it's time to move on. Don't feel guilty for not responding immediately. Tell them, your pastor said you don't have to be accessible to everybody at all times. I, see, y'all like to throw out your pastor said. This is one time I'm telling you, you can say your pastor said. <laughs> Spouses don't go home saying, my pastor said. The pastor said, you dirty and no good. No, the pastor didn't say that. Pastor said, stop clipping your toenails around me. Mm -mm. <laughs> she didn't say that either. Don't feel guilty for choosing yourself. Yeah, yeah, oh, gosh, that, that hit right between some Christian's eyes right here, right now, especially this side of the room because you're thinking, what? <laughs> that is not very Christ-like. Well, I believe it is. Christ practiced self-care. Why don't you? Self-care is essential to care for others. If you can't take care of yourself, then you're going to have a really hard time caring for others for the long term in which God has called you to help care for them. And if the airlines know that it's better for you to put your own mask on first before you start trying to help other people, then I know doggone well that God knows you need to take care of you first in order that you can help others. Say amen, somebody. So don't feel guilty about self-care. Don't feel guilty for being really good at doing something. Accept a compliment when somebody says, oh, my goodness, great job. Or, oh, my goodness, did you lose weight? Hell yeah, I did. Yes, you then reduce your calories, you working out every day, accept the compliment. Don't be like, oh, I don't know, but no, accept the compliment. 
it's okay to be really good at your job. Don't feel guilty for saying no to things that don't feel good to you. That's not affirming to you. That's not life-giving to you. Don't feel guilty for taking a break. Right? We live in this hustle bustle culture. Booked and busy, booked and busy. <laughs> Jesus ministered, he'd go off, he'd take a break. Jesus would minister, he'd go off to the side, take a break. Again, if Jesus could do these things, shouldn't we? Without guilt, don't feel guilty for standing up and feeling good about yourself. Shame and guilt is often associated with these things that we should be okay with being and doing. And God helps us by giving us grace instead of guilt. As I just said, the accuser can only remind you of your sin. But you know what the advocate, do? advocate does? The, the, the advocate, through God's grace, reminds us you are loved because God made you worthy. Because God made you as God's child. So you are a child of God and you, you're worthy. And I've got some, some good news for some of y'all today. The chains of shame and the, the quilt of guilt can be broken and buried in your life today. You can be set free from shame and guilt today if you want to let it go. But some of y'all like wearing it like a Snuggie. Because you think if you hold on to it, somehow you're getting a reward for it. You ain't getting no reward. It's just chipping away at your life. Let it go. Say, let it go. Let it go, Elsa. Let it go. And that's my hope and my prayer that today you will hear God saying, I saw what you did. Come to me anyway. I saw what you said. I heard what you said. And I still want to hold you in my arms. They are stretched out to you anyway. I saw how you behave. You need me now more than ever before. So don't run away from me from the moment that you actually do need me. Come to me anyway. Yeah, you did it. Admit it. Confess it. Own it. Take accountability for it. Don't stay stuck in it and allow me to help you through it that's not who you are freedom friends is keeping uh, the four R's in mind realizing God already knows about your shame and about your mistake remembering that despite your shame God still loves you rest in knowing that no matter what you've done God will never leave you if I was at a different kind of church y'all be standing on your feet doing cartwheels right now yes God will never leave you. You might try to leave God, but God ain't going to leave you. Rejoice. God has already taken care of the shame. God has already taken care of it. Won't you let it go? One of my favorite authors, Dr. Brene Brown, as our band comes back. Oh, that's what I mean. We are a highbrow congregation. We like to read, <laughs> or at least listen to podcasts. <laughs> Dr. Brene Brown has written extensively on the issue of shame and guilt, and she offers that the antidote to shame is empathy and self-compassion. Hmm. Yeah, friends, when we recognize our feelings, when we refrain from our negative thoughts, and look at situations from a different perspective. Acknowledge the things that, that are triggers and, and identify harmful thought patterns. Get professional help if needed. Say amen, somebody. To assist us in getting through this guilt or shame journey that we've been on so that we don't have to do it alone. Then we will begin to experience true freedom. And I'm going to repeat that. You are not alone. God is with us. Let's pray. Creator God, I thank you. I thank you for your gifts today. The gifts that you've offered us through freedom. The gifts of shattering shame and getting rid of guilt. Lord, I recognize that they might come up in different forms in our lives because we're not perfect people. 
we will make mistakes. And if guilt is the guidepost that helps to remind us to not continue to make the same mistakes, then Lord, may it be used as a positive tool. But if it's keeping us bound and not free to live our lives as children of God and not free to live our lives as the parents you've called us to be, as the daughters or sons or as the, as the spouses or partners or, or as the business leaders or, or as the employees or, or as the friends or whatever role we, we serve in this life. If shame and guilt is keeping us from fulfilling those roles, Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, please help us. Less of us and more of you, oh God. You've already rebuked the devourer for our sake. So we trust, Lord, that you will continue to grow us and shape us as we continue to move towards you. For your son and daughter that, is, that has felt far from you, may this be the moment where they sense your presence and know that they don't have to run away, that everywhere that they go, you are there. And may that assurance give us peace. May that assurance give us joy. May that assurance give us hope, especially during times of trouble. Lord, I thank you for your grace and your mercies that are new to all of us. That we no longer have to bear the weight of shame. Whatever it is, Lord, I don't know what's on their hearts. God, you do. May you take it and may you release it to wherever it needs to be, whether that's back out to the sea of forgetfulness where you can help them to live restored, where you can help us to feel renewed. But most of all, God, I thank you that we are lifted and gifted on this day. And I offer all of this in the mighty and matchless name of the one who has changed my life. In the name of Jesus the Christ. And all of God's children said with a great big shout out. Amen. Amen.